geachte aanwezigen. Welkom bij deze academische zitting waarop professor Sluimer haar leerstoel cardiovasculaire pathofysiologie zal aanvaarden. Mijn naam is Stef Kremers, ik ben vice-decaan van de faculteit Health, Medicine and Life Sciences van de Universiteit Maastricht en pro-rector van deze academische zitting. Uh, ik ken professor Sluimer uh, als een enorm gepassioneerde en talentvolle onderzoeker. Dat zullen alle onderzoekers in deze zaal erkennen. En ook enorm in haar waarderen. Erkennen, waarderen, termen die we tegenwoordig gelukkig steeds vaker uitspreken eh, als het gaat over het HR-beleid van deze universiteit. En terecht, mag ik als vice van deze portefeuille wel zeggen. Eh, en daarom heb ik besloten om deze introductie... In deze introductie de visie van de Universiteit Maastricht op herkennen en waarderen te gebruiken om professor Sluimer te evalueren. Nu we er toch zijn. Ik noem al even de passie en het talent op het gebied van onderzoek, maar we kijken in deze universiteit graag breed naar de persoon. Breder dus dan alleen op het gebied van onderwijs en onderzoek. En als ik zo naar Judith kijk, zie ik en de mensen die dicht bij haar staan een aantal andere kenmerken die haar echt speciaal maken. En daar wil ik in deze introductie er een paar van uitlichten. Judith gaat met een ongelooflijke doorzettingskracht voor haar academisch succes, maar nooit ten koste van het levensgeluk van hen die onder haar supervisie vallen. Dat heb ik van meerdere plekken teruggehoord in de voorbereiding op dit praatje. Dit is echt iets waar ze zich actief om bekommert. Binnen haar werk maakt ze dus de begeleiding van haar PhD-studenten tot prioriteit. Ongeacht hoe druk ze het heeft. Ze streeft naar optimale teamprestaties. En dat is een van de dingen die we graag binnen deze universiteit van onze leiders zien. Collectief leiderschap, of collaborative leadership wordt het ook wel genoemd. En dat is namelijk een van de dimensies waarop we in het kader van erkennen en waarderen meer aandacht willen. Een andere dimensie die daar binnen van belang is, is impact. En daarmee bedoelen we onder andere dat we onze onderzoeksbevindingen niet alleen in wetenschappelijke publicaties en wetenschappelijke tijdschriften publiceren, maar ook op andere manieren de doelgroep en daarmee bedoel ik vaak ook de burger bereiken. En ook op dat vlak is professor Sluimer enorm actief. Ze bereikt niet alleen de burger, maar ook haar collega's, bijvoorbeeld via praatjes bij symposia, workshops, women in stem, symposia, Twitter um, en zelfs via de kinderen in de klas. Dus een brede kijk op de medewerker hè, had ik het over. En dat klinkt waarschijnlijk logisch, maar het brengt ook uitdagingen met zich mee. Bijvoorbeeld, hoe ga je nou in dat kader om met bevorderingen in carrièrepaden? Um, dan kun je dus niet zomaar een standaard checklist uit de kast uh, trekken, maar moet je de context snappen van waarbinnen onze medewerkers werken. En ook daarin speelt Judith binnen onze faculteit een hele belangrijke rol. Judith is namelijk voorzitter van de commissie die het bestuur hierover adviseert. Daarin moet ze dus samen met haar commissie echt pionierswerk doen um, om erkennen en waarderen binnen onze faculteit vorm te geven, waarvoor mijn Hele hartelijke dank en bewondering voor de manier waarop je dat aanpakt. Maar ook het voorzitterschap van deze commissie vult ze met enorm veel kunde, inzet, integriteit en betrouwbaarheid in. En dat zit dus ook nog bovenop die andere dingen die ik zojuist benoemde. En dat noemen we binnen de UM citizenship, academic citizenship. En dat vinden we heel belangrijk dat medewerkers zich inzetten om de motor van de Universiteit Maastricht draaiende uh, te houden, zonder dat het meteen een bijdrage levert aan iemands persoonlijke prestaties. Dus dat doet professor Sluimer ook al. Geen standaard checklist, dat zei ik al, maar in het lijstje dat ik nu uit de kast trek om haar te evalueren, kan ik toch wel stellen, she ticks all boxes. In ieder geval, dat zou je zeggen van een afstandje. Tijd om dat eens te checken bij mensen die uh, haar van heel dichtbij kennen. En dat levert dan soms toch wel een inzichtelijk kijkje achter de schermen. Uh, werkdagen duren soms lang om dit allemaal uh, te bereiken. En als man lief s'avonds laat vraagt of die laptop nu eens eindelijk uit kan, dan kan Judith nogal eens geïrriteerd uit de hoek komen. En die noemt dat Dutch directness. 
Uh, wij kunnen natuurlijk alleen maar raden hoe dat er in werkelijkheid uitziet, maar ik denk misschien heeft iedereen daar toch wel een beeld bij. Uh, een ander interessant weetje voor u is waarschijnlijk dat Judith veel tijd en energie heeft gestopt in het voorbereiden van haar oratie. En dan bedoel ik niet zozeer de inhoud van de oratie, maar ook de keuze voor haar jurk en haar schoenen. Uh, verbaasd sommigen niet, uh, begrijp ik. Uh, en omdat het kledingadvies van Andy niet verder ging dan wear the black one was het gevolg een niet aflatende stroom aan koeriers aan de voordeur van Huis de Sluimer. Met kledingstukken in alle soorten, maten en kleuren. Ze kent de koeriers inmiddels allemaal persoonlijk, heb ik begrepen. We kunnen nu natuurlijk door haar toga niet zo goed zien wat nu het eindresultaat van dit intensieve proces is geweest. Maar ik kan u alvast verklappen. She wears the black one. <lacht> Tijd om te gaan luisteren. Tijd om te gaan luisteren naar de inhoud. Ik geef hierbij heel graag het woord aan professor Judith Sluimer voor haar inaugurele rede getiteld A Breath of Fresh Air in Cardiovascular Research. Thank you very much for that kind and personal introduction. Dear producer, family, friends, colleagues, It's a great pleasure to welcome you today to my inauguration. It is exactly 15 years and one day ago since I was last standing here doing my PC defense. Some of you were even there. At least today, there is no crossfire of questions. You just have to listen to me. My research over this time has led to my appointment as professor of cardiovascular pathophysiology. These last two long words mean that I study the heart and blood vessels in health and disease. I chose this title for two reasons. First, because it refers to air, the oxygen that blood vessels transport, and because I studied the lack of oxygen in blood vessel disease. And second, because of its metaphoric meaning. Someone or something that is new and different and makes everything seem more exciting. I believe this is important for research. And I will discuss both meanings in this lecture. That sounds like a lot already, doesn't it? It certainly calls for getting out for a fresh breath of fresh air right now. And I certainly wouldn't mind escaping this auditorium at the moment. What do you think when you think about getting a breath of fresh air? It's, for everybody, it's different. For me, it's, a, it's the uh, walk in the rolling hills around Maastricht or the openness of the gra grassy meadows reaching the horizon around Gouda, where I, where I grew up, or standing on top of these snowy mountains, like here in the Rocky Mountains, which I visited last spring. It's funny though, because although my mind thought the air was quite refreshing, my body did not agree. Why is that? That's because the amount of oxygen, or O2, in the air is much lower in the mountains than here at sea level. If you go to high altitudes too quickly, your body doesn't have time to adapt and cope with these low levels. You can even develop high altitude sickness, which is not fun, I can personally assure you. Why don't you take a short moment to hold your breath and experience the importance of oxygen? It soon becomes a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? It's good I didn't keep my breath until waiting for the ceremony to take place since my appointment as professor was already two and a half years ago. The lack of oxygen is ultimately life-threatening and we all have seen examples in our life. Small ones, like a child suffocating in a piece of orange or a spinach leaf, or maybe more impactful, like a stepson swimming too long underwater, which stopped his heart beating. Thankfully, these events all ended well, as oxygen reply, supply restarted, and Jasper, George, and I are still here. Oxygen is essential for all organs in our body and the cells they are made of. Cells need oxygen to produce the energy they need to perform their functions. Muscle cells in the heart need it to contract and pump blood around the body. Our immune cells 
needed to remove unwanted things, like bacteria or cholesterol, for anything and everything, actually. So how does oxygen reach all these cells? That is through the cardiovascular system, this closed system of the heart and blood vessels. Blood passing through the lungs will receive oxygen, and it's transported with every beat of the heart towards the rest of the bodies in the arteries, here in blue. After delivering oxygen, blood is transported back to the heart and lungs via veins, here in blue, to start another cycle. So in addition to oxygen, we need a healthy, functional cardiovascular system to keep us healthy. But there are several threats to this system, making it function less. These threats include aging, smoking, no exercise, and an unhealthy diet, leading to high cholesterol and sugar levels in the blood. I will explain for some of these threats how they change the function of blood vessels. In young people, blood vessels, as you can see here in red, are elastic. The blood exerts a certain amount of pressure on the vessels, the blood pressure. With age, connective tissue, bindweefsel in Dutch, builds up in our arteries, making them stiffer. The reduced flexibility increases the blood pressure. Imagine pushing the same volume through a stiffer tube. It simply requires more pressure. Higher blood pressure, in turn, increases the risk of developing a disease of the blood vessels, called atherosclerosis. This disease is the cause of a heart attack or stroke. And to prevent this disease, we need to know more about the development of atherosclerosis. And I will tell you what we already know. Here you see a drawing of the heart and the coronary arteries, the blood vessels that supply oxygen to the heart. The artery consists of three layers. The inside, the intima with endothelial cells lining the vessel, making sure the blood does not clot. The media, the middle part, with smooth muscle cells. If these contract or relax, the blood vessels become smaller or bigger. That regulates the blood pressure. And the outer layer, the adventitia, with nerves, fibroblasts, that are cells that are produce connective tissue, and some miniature vessels that supply oxygen to this media. An unhealthy diet increases cholesterol in the blood, which will enter the vessel wall. There it will trigger immune cells, like macrophages here in blue, to remove the cholesterol. The contractile mu muscles, smooth muscle cells from the media, migrate in here and also produce connective tissue. A thick cap of connective tissue here in purple shields the plaque from the blood to prevent the uh, blood from clotting. We call this buildup of cells and cholesterol a plaque. With time, this plaque grows, narrowing the area where blood can flow through. But more seriously, macrophages degrade this cap, making it thinner. And macrophages and smooth muscle cells die, leaving a graveyard of cell debris here in yellow. We call this graveyard the necrotic core. These advanced plaques can rupture at the site of a thin cap, causing the blood to clot. If this blood clot or thrombus is very large, it will block the flow of blood. So if that happens in your heart, like here, your heart will not receive oxygen. This is what we call a heart attack. If this happens in the arteries of your neck, the carotid arteries, we call it a stroke. These advanced plaques here come in two flavors. Stable plaques with a thick cap and small necrotic core and no inflammation. And unstable plaques with a big graveyard and a thin cap. These ones have a larger risk to rupture and cause a disease. So the scientists in my field have spent a lot of effort making those plaques more stable. This was also the goal of my PhD project. Although the approach we used to get there changed completely when it turned out to be technically impossible. Luckily, my promoter, Mordamen, was an experienced supervisor and had a backup project. 
For this project, he sent me to the lab of Dr. Jean-Marie Gasque in the Collège de France in Paris for three months. Not a bad deal, right? But it turned out the backup ID was also not supported by the data I gathered. So that project went down the drain as well. Challenging times, I can tell you. Here I was with all my work and ambition and one and a half years into a four-year project and I had nothing. But every cloud has a silver lining. And Jean-Marie was a thinker. He was a very curious scientist who never worked with human arteries before. And I brought them to his lab. So he wanted me to try one of his probes on the arteries I brought. This probe detected the oxygen sensor HIF. And I was, it was the first time that HIF was detected in human plaques. So Jean-Marie's curiosity sparked my interest in this oxygen sensor. And with coaching of Matt, I developed my own project to focus on the function of this novel process in atherosclerosis. To explain what we investigated, I will first need to explain the function of HIF in the biology of cells. And the three scientists that discovered HIF, how, how it works, received the Nobel Prize in 2019. This is a schematic drawing of a cell. And inside is a structure called the nucleus. In this nucleus, uh, our genetic material or DNA is contained. This DNA holds genes that encode for all the building blocks in our body. This determines not only the color of your eyes, but also the function of a cell. And HIF can modify the amount of genes and certain genes that change how a cell functions when there is little oxygen. In normal oxygen conditions, when there's O2 present, HIF is modified by enzymes, the prolyl hydroxylase domain proteins, or PhD proteins. They add a hydroxy group to HIF, and this targets it for degradation. So with oxygen, there is no HIF. But these enzymes need oxygen for their function. So when there is no oxygen or very little of it, they cannot modify HIF, and HIF goes to the nucleus and starts the change of genes. This is all tailored so that we can reduce the use of oxygen and restore the oxygen supply, and in the end, we end up with a cell that can live despite a little bit amount of oxygen. So thanks to Jean-Marie, we knew that, low, that HIF was present, but not whether hypoxia was there. So we first set out to detect this lack of oxygen in human atherosclerosis. As plaques in the carotid artery are removed in patients with symptoms, we often use those tissues. And we started a collaboration with the vascular surgeons in our hospital, like Geert Willem Schuren, Jan Willem Dame, and more recently Barend Mees. I am still very happy with this great collaboration. Before surgery, we gave patients a tracer to mark the hypoxic cells. Then after the surgeons removed it, I processed it in the lab to see if I could detect hypoxia. Under the microscope, hypoxic cells will appear with a brown color. So after all of these steps, I was very impatient and eager to see the results. And you can imagine how excited I was that I indeed saw this brown signal. This is a cross-section of an actual human plaque. This is the only bit left where blood could have flown, flowed through. And these brown cells here are experiencing hypoxia. We showed that hypoxia was related to plaque instability and to consequences of HIF signaling, such as the presence of miniature vessels. I studied these miniature vessels further in the States in the States, with a, in the lab of Dr. Renu Vermani, the Iron Lady of Cardiovascular Pathology. And I was very pleased that all this work gave me enough data to finally finish my PhD in 2008. A bit later than planned, but finished nevertheless. So thinking about my next job, I wanted to get trained more in the biology and function of macrophages. We noted that it was only the, the macrophages that, was, uh, that, were more, that were hypoxic. So I went to New York City to work on those macrophages in the lab of Professor Ira Tavis at Columbia University. You might recognize somebody else here as well. I was funded by a Rubicon grant with the Dutch Research Council NWO and a Koetsa Talent Fellowship from Maastricht University. 
It was a good thing they were in euros and the dollar was quite low, so we can, could enjoy all the aspects of the city, as you can see. An excellent time and training. Although professionally it was a tough and very competitive environment, I still use many insights I gained during that time. But all things come to an end, and I went back to the Netherlands. There, Madame hired me as a postdoc in the Paris Consortium to collaborate with Eline Coy, Joachim Wildberger, and Felix Motagui. We used advanced imaging tools, such as PET, CT, and MRI, to detect hypoxia. And we wanted to do that on scans of patients, without the need for surgical removal. The blood vessels in this MRI image shows where the plug was. And the turquoise signal here indicates there was hypoxia present, even still in the patient. So by now we know for sure that hypoxia was present, but we still had no clue what effect it had on the development of atherosclerosis. And if we could, if we were just simple a consequence or a cause that we can use to treat. So that was the main aim of my group for the last 10 years. And with funding of a veiny early career come from MWO, I deciphered the role of oxygen hypoxia, and the PhD enzymes in the development of atherosclerosis. I did this by changing the oxygen supply, oxygen signaling, and blocking some oxygen-dependent processes. Jenny de Bruin and René Tilly explored the consequences of hypoxia, like the malformation of the microvasculature, or changes in en energy production that are needed in, in low oxygen conditions, and processes to recycle building blocks and save energy, such as chaperone-mediated autophagy. This work was funded by the Leduc Foundation and a senior postal grant of the Dutch Heart Foundation. It was a great collaboration with Anna Maria Cuervo in the US. But today I will highlight the work on oxygen and hypoxia signaling in more detail. We started with a quick and dirty approach to increase oxygen supply in an animal model of atherosclerosis. We used a gas that had an extremely high oxygen content. And we compared mice breathing this gas with 95% oxygen to mice breathing normal air with 21% oxygen. This prevented plaque hypoxia and plaque instability. Here you can see a tissue section of mouse atherosclerosis outlined here. And what you can see maybe is that the white areas indicate the graveyard area. And with this overlay of the tissue, you can see there's much more white in normal air and that we could prevent that when in high oxygen content. So there was less necrosis, less white areas, when we let the mice breed high oxygen, high oxygen. This study showed for the first time that hypoxia was causal in the development of atherosclerosis. But it's not so easy to sit in this ox oxygen chamber all day, so we wanted to find out a more molecular and more sophisticated method. So we tried that by focusing on the enzymes modifying HIF the PhD enzymes I, I told you about earlier. So Elke Marsh, Thomas Thelen, and, jo and Jasper Demand blocked the PhD sensors in all cells of the body using what we call a knockout mouse. We received these mice through a collaboration with Peter Carmelit in Leuven. These mice have uh, increased hypoxia signaling, as if they're experiencing hypoxia, even if oxygen is present. They showed unexpectedly that blood cholesterol levels were much reduced in our mouse models in the absence of PhDs. This blocked, so a blunted arrow, blocked the development of atherosclerosis. Other groups showed around the same time that drugs blocking the PhDs in humans also blocked cholesterol levels. So a positive side effect, perhaps a new drug to treat atherosclerosis. As I said before, it was mostly the macrophages that were hypoxic. So Kim van Kuyk, Jasper de Mant, and Thomas Dele studied the role of the PhDs specifically in macrophages. So they studied atherosclerosis in mice that missed PhDs only in macrophages. And we can compare them to mice with PhDs in their macrophages. And when Marion Geibels, our animal pathologist, looked at the plaques under the microscope, she was struck by the enormous amount of connective tissue. She'd never seen anything like that before. So to find out why that was, we studied the macrophages and small muscle cells in the plugs. We knew these are normally responsible for the accumulation of connective tissues. 
but they didn't show differences between mice with and without PhDs. So to dig a little deeper, Kim set up a, an assay to measure connective tissue production by cells in culture. She cultured macrophages with PhDs here in green and without PhD here in red. During culture, macrophages secrete mediators in their culture medium. These mediators are used to communicate to other cells. Kim transferred the medium to, to, with, these, with the signals to smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts, because these normally produce collagen. And then she then measured if this communication changed connective tissue accumulation. And it did. Fibroblasts giving the red medium, without PhD, made more connective tissue than those receiving medium from the, the, the macrophages with PhDs. But like we thought before, there was no difference between the red and the green bar in smooth muscle cells. This suggests that the fibroblasts, but not the smooth muscle cells, are responsible for the increased connective tissue in the plaques. To find out what mediator could be responsible, we looked at the genetic material of the cells again. Change in genes change the amount or type of signals. So Javier Perales and Julio Seyes from Heidelberg performed a very clever analysis. They compared genes in the changes in the genes expressed by the sending macrophages together with changes in genes by the receiving fibroblast. And this analysis predicted that enhanced secretion of osteopontin by the macrophages caused the increase of connective tissue in the fibroblasts. And we showed that their prediction was also true in mouse and human plaques. We used two large studies of human plaques to compare the genetic material of stable and unstable plaques. We used the master HPS cohort for my colleagues Eric Biesen and Han Yin, and the Bai cohort in collaboration with Lubica Matix from Karolinska, who is also here today. These important resources have and will make sure our work is relevant for the patients. We're not treating mice, are we? But back to these fibroblasts. This chance finding of the communication between macrophages and fibroblasts intrigued me. At the time, nobody had detected fibroblasts in plaques. They were just known to reside in the outer layer, the adventitia, these red cells here. And when we tried to detect fibroblasts in plaques, we could not distinguish them from the smooth muscle cells in the media and in the plaque. The markers that others had used until then were also expressed by the smooth muscle cells. So we needed better markers to identify the fibroblasts. And we found better markers using a new technology called single cell sequencing. With this technique, you are not looking at a soup of all cells of the vascular wall and a mix of their genetic material, but you look at the individual ingredients or genetic material of the cells one by one. So that would allow us, here you would not be able to distinguish which genes was, was coming from a smooth muscle cell or a fibroblast, but here we can easily do that. So you could say we created a fingerprint of each cell. And this work by Kim van Kuyk, Ian McCracken, and René Tilly was started thanks to my affiliation with Edinburgh University. My team performed the experiments in collaboration with Andy Baker and Neil Henderson in Edinburgh University. Rafael Kramans lab, in Aachen and Leon Schurgers lab in Maastricht. Funded by a next career grant from NWO de Vidi, we are now deciphering the function of fibroblasts and the new markers we found in health and disease arteries. This again led to a new and exciting avenue of studying aging of the blood vessels, vascular aging. One of the fibroblast markers we found had no known function in the vasculature. But lower levels of this fibroblast marker are associated with aging and high blood pressure in humans. To prove that loss of the marker is causal to the development of this high blood pressure, Sebastian Asselberg, Dils Arcader, and Baizhou Yu used mice that lacked the, ma the marker, another knockout. And they found that old mice actually feel older. Their blood vessels are less flexible and they have a higher blood pressure. By now, you may start to shift in your seats. How long are we going on with this? And aging, Pfft, that's not for me. I don't feel old. 
And to be fair, I don't feel old either. But I'm starting to need some therapy for aging. I am always looking for my phone, wallet, keys. I can always find them, so they're not really lost. I just can't find them straight away. This had been fixed by an age therapy for my team. They gifted me a GPS tracker with an iPhone app. And to be honest, I do not need one tracker. I need several. Of course, this is a minor issue, and effects of diseases associated with old age are more severe. We all want to grow old, but we do not want to feel old. My grandmother used to say it already, and I always thought, Pff. but I have since re realized its truth. The World Health Organization shows that we indeed get older, but we don't stay healthy. Our health span is shorter than our lifespan. Now you may think there is no solution. I can't really change the date I was born, which is true again. But we can change our biological age. The biological processes that change with aging can be modified. And my vision of the future is to change the vascular effects of aging. I want to rejuvenate the blood vessels, making or keeping the vasculature healthy for a longer period. And with this approach, I hope to increase the time we live a healthy life, making us feel young into old age. After this first part on blood vessels, I've come to the second topic of my inaugural lecture. I would like to address the metaphorical meaning of that breath of fresh air, and it's important for scientific research in general. A breath of fresh air means finding a source of innovation and excitement. Great science brings something new and exciting to existing knowledge, a small or even a giant innovation. I believe this can only be done if there's a continuous source of innovation and excitement of the scientists. But how can we obtain that fresh air? The concept that unites this, in my opinion, is diversity. A wide variety of different people, experiences, views, tools, approaches stimulates innovation. And this diversity concept is close to my heart for many reasons. Not in the least, as I am still recognized as different to the local population, even after 28 years, even though I make a mean Maastricht too, or a zoo phrase. The way I speak with a hard G or a G differentiates me from the locals who speak Maastricht dialect. But you know, I am a Maastrichtse, I'm just a little different. On a more serious note, being different and diversity should be part of various aspects of science to keep academia healthy. Diversity in people, when composing teams, consortia and management, but also in the types of research that are stimulated by policymakers. Research can be ca roughly categorized as clinical or preclinical. Clinical research focuses on diagnosis or treatment of people with a disease. Preclinical or basic science studies how exactly a healthy person develops a disease. More and more, funding agencies try to push researchers to focus on clinical science, to avoid animal research, to focus only on predefined topics without free choice what you investigate. And there are advantages to this, of course, like focusing more money and efforts in one area to push it forward. But they seem to ignore there are also disadvantages. Certain things can only be tested in animal models, as testing in people is unethical and might harm them. And simple cell cultures, they do not represent the full complexity of a living being. Of course, the benefit of these experiments is and should be weighed heavily against the discomfort of the animals. Any innovation in animal free testing should be used before in vivo animal studies. I had the pleasure to work with Eric Beeson on such alternatives, like the macro scheme developed and tested by Lieve Temmerman, Margot Fontaine and Adele Ruder. Now this, be, now this is being adopted for vascular fibroblasts by Baijiu Yu and Lieve, a good example of basic science. So basic research without predefined topics is usually the source of groundbreaking or disruptive new invention, inventions. Less freedom and money for basic research is a threat for innovation. And indeed, 
disruptive science has generally diminished over recent years, as shown by a study in the journal Nature this year. The average disruption of papers declines in all areas of research. It's also the same for patents. Now, the absolute number of disruptive papers does remain stable, but we just published so many more papers, papers than before. The authors further show that the decline is also due to the focus of scientists on a much smaller area, super specialization, and publishing many lower quality papers. These increase the chance to get funding of an individual, but it reduces innovation. I suggest universities and funding agencies to allow researchers time to think, to read, to focus on quality, and to allocate more funding to basic research without a free choice of topic. In addition to diversity in funding, diversity within teams is important. And I've worked with many people, as you can see. Team diversity will foster a healthy academic environment. Fresh input of new team members with a different cultural, educational background, different age, sex or gender, brings new ideas and ways of working. The German university system actively stimulates changing university before becoming a full professor. In my opinion, employing scientists and management from outside university helps to revive existing system. And this has certainly worked for the previous and current rector and the faculty's university professors. Of course, it's not always easy, of course it's not always easy or possible to change institutes. My personal circumstances prevent me now from moving house. But I can use my honorary position in Edinburgh for new input to stay fresh. As you will know, my husband Andy has his main job in Edinburgh, and we work in both places. Andy and I are pretty complementary in life and science. This resulted in several joint grants, joint papers, and my co-supervision of two Edinburgh PhD students, John Hung and Francesca Vagante, and of course, filling the entire first row with a put-together family. It also introduced me to single-cell sequencing. This fingerprinting technology I showed you earlier, this certainly helped to get that VD career grant. These facts make it so obvious to stimulate diversity. But still, I see it being ignored, leading to a loss of diversity. Until recently, national consortia, such as CVON or ONCODE, included only the same in crowd, ignoring what younger scientists or those located outside the Randstad can offer. So to receive a certain Heart Foundation grant, I was required to connect with existing consortia. But some consortia refused to open up. We already stimulate our own talent, is what I heard. For sure, no breath of fresh air, no diversity, and potentially damaging for innovation. At the same time, it is also damaging for the motivation and career of young scientists, particularly in this already tough funding climate. This is due to the low budget for scientific research in general. The low budget means that many people apply for the same grants. So for every 10 grants I write, I might receive one, might. Since this costs me about two, three weeks each, I waste up to 20 weeks. Excluding holidays, and we do have a lot of those here, this is 50% of my yearly effort. So much wasted time. Do you know any other business allowing such inefficient use of resources? I don't. You can imagine, there's this, oh, sorry. There we are. You can imagine this wasted time puts pressure on people as we still have to fulfill so many duties. We need to acquire funding, write papers, supervise students, teach, review other people's papers, their grants, their PhD theses, be an active part of the scientific community in our own institute, but also internationally by being member or chair of councils, editorial boards or societies. We need to present our work at national and international meetings, preferably on personal invitation. We have to organize meetings, post on social media, reach out to the general public, read other people's work, think and plan experiments, 
all this while going through at least 100 emails a day, <gasps> I need some air. Like I mentioned earlier, we really need more time to think and read. Thankfully, I'm very efficient. And the support and freedom that Axel Thurhausen, the head of my department, and Eric Beeson gave me is crucial for my life work balance. They let me plan my working hours flexibly. So I can spend quality time with my kids in the week they are with us and work more in the weeks they are not. And thankfully, I really like this job. I just love interpreting graphs, coming up with my own ideas. And when I am so lucky to get them funded, I can actually bring them into practice. All while working with a bunch of motivated young people and skilled colleagues. What is not to love? However, I do feel the pressure too. And I see both peers and younger scientists turn away from academia. It seriously depresses me. I call for a change to increase research for science and an open scientific community embracing diversity. This call for diversity is already being pushed by the nationwide initiative to re redefine the recognition and reward of academics. A pro-rector already mentioned it. This initiative is led by the chair of the university board, Professor Rianne Letchert. It recognizes that people have different talents, cannot excel in all tasks, and wants to assure that not only good scientists, but also good teachers and team players feel rewarded. I am chair of the committee that advises the Dean on promotions. And in the last three years, we adapted the promotion guidelines to pave the way towards this new policy. We focus more on quality of accomplishments and keep an open mind for non-standard career tracks. This year, the new career policy is implemented, led by Vice Dean Steph Kramers, our pro-rector today. But the latest long discussions in our committee show it has not become easier to formulate an advice. The balance between an individual CV and keeping somehow a sort of standard for everybody is ever more complex. The committee takes great care and time to evaluate the career and accomplishments of people up for promotion. We are dealing with our colleagues and we want to avoid unnecessary damaging effects of a negative advice. However, quite often we evaluate CVs where it is clear that a lack of mentoring has not prepared colleagues for a next job function. This, this disappointment, when not promoted, could have been avoided. So I urge both head of, de head of department and colleagues looking to be promoted to carefully discuss talents, accomplishments and career development. And this will be an Im important task for the new development boards to mentor each scientific employee. If the new policy is able to stimulate people feeling rewarded and to increase diversity, is what something we will see in the coming years. In my opinion, mentoring, like the development board, is a good solution to prevent young scientists from leaving ac academia and to keep diversity. Thankfully, I had some good role models and mentors. As a new PhD student, I thought having a successful career in academia meant I could not have children. I mean, how, was I how I, could I combine the long hours and travel with the family life? Women show me it is possible to do so, for Esther Lutgens and Sylvia Heinemann. Now, it's my turn. I try to be a good example for young scientists. And when I present a career talk for the Master of Biomedical Sciences, I don't talk only about my science, I share that I'm a mother too. For the last 13 years, I've also been a mentor during the bachelor program. And for the PhD students and postdocs, I guide or meet. And some of the mentees are even here in the audience, I saw. I also take time to excite kids in primary school for science, actively changing their image that scientists are men. Like Einstein, Cairo Gerlus, and Professor Calculus, which are known in Dutch as Willy Wotter, Willy Wotter and Professor Zonnebloem, by the, by the way. The kids were excited by the blood vessels and the microphone, microscope, <laughs> but they were more impressed that I made balloons from gloves or that I can still up, dress up like Harry Potter during work times. Good mentoring has become ever more necessary to keep junior faculty in biomedical sciences after the pandemic. And we didn't even prevent the drain of women in academia in all those years. Although we start with more women during bachelor and master studies, 
this switches from assistant professorship onwards. I think you can already do the math when you look, at, look around you. The leaky pipe or glass ceiling is caused by lack of, of support during child raising years, a socially unsafe or a hostile work environment, and the old boys network, men promoting men. I do think we have come a long way in the latter. The struggles that female leaders, like the former hospital director Maya van der Visser describes, are mostly alien to me. And Maastricht is basically ruled by women at the moment, as the mayor, president of the university, the director Magnificus, the hospital director, and our dean are female. Maybe there's something to be said about diversity there too. Nevertheless, I struggled sometimes as a young parent. I was a member of a committee that held 8 a.m. meetings. This meant that I could not attend half of them as I was a divorced mom taking my kids to school and nobody else could do that. My request to change the time was rejected. Did they even value my opinion? In any case, I did not let this demotivate me. And when I became chair of the committee, I changed the meeting time immediately. <laughs> In the UK, there is a policy that prevents any meetings taking place before 10 a.m. and after 4 p.m. to allow female and male staff with young children to form their caring duties. This policy is enforced with financial consequences. If universities do not adhere, certain research funding cannot be applied for. Perhaps something to consider for a government and university board. Unfortunately, Several cases of intimidation, or even worse, have recently come to light in this university. And however appalling and sad, I think it is actually good that the system is now apparently safe enough for people to step forward. And management is not sweeping it under the carpet. You see, I did experience some form of intimidation during my international jobs. Back then, I never felt safe to address it, and just made it smaller. Actually, I even forgot about it until recently. Not the best solution. Thankfully, here and now, the University and the Cardiovascular Institute, CADEM, are actively trying to keep our scientists in academia to improve safety, diversity, and inclusivity. I have told you diversity is lost by several reasons, including lack of social safety, time, and funding. The lack of time and funding also jeopardizes diversity in personal skills and qualities. There is not just enough time anymore to explore what excites you, to deviate, understand where your talents lie, and to think. In my case, the story of my career, I told in the beginning, seemed like a straight line towards a goal, and in line with the strong people say I have. But actually, I started out with many explorations during my internships. The first quite smelly, studying the effect of garlic on bacteria with Daisy Junkers, and the second on biology of cancer with Tom de Groei, and the third one in Australia with John Hancock. The Australian adventure was possible thanks to the support of my parents, Maastricht University and the Wilhelmina Cancer Foundation. These internships let me develop skills as a scientist and a person. Getting the small grants for Australia probably helped in acquiring funds afterwards. And my first job after the master was not a conscious choice either. It just came on my path. As clinical research manager, I worked with orthopedic patients with a hip or knee replacement. And although I had a great time, clinical science didn't excite me as much. I discovered because of my deviations and experiences that I really wanted a basic science challenge. And although wanting to turn back to cancer research, Madame soon convinced me to work on cardiovascular disease, which ultimately ended up being a pretty good choice considering I'm standing here today. Despite the hurdles I described earlier, or maybe even because of them, as they strengthened my problem-solving skills confidence in my abilities, and broadened my knowledge and mind, making me into the scientist I am today. Open for the breath of fresh air by people and topics I encounter, allowing me to develop new and innovative concepts at every stage of my career until now, and hopefully in the future. To be able to get to this day and stage in my career, I am grateful to many people for their support and commitment so for their support for this appointment, I would like to thank my supervisory committee, Nanna de Vries, Annemie Schools, and Seth Kramers in Change and Composition, and the steady crew, Axel Thurhausen and Tilman Hacking. I thank Karim in general for all the support with the tenure track early on, 
and giving me chances to develop skills in the strategic board, division board, grants and incentive team, and for advice on grants from the research council. I told you we had to do a lot of things outside. Huh? I thank the PhD students, technicians, and postdocs I supervised, and those that I worked with side by side. It was great working with you and learning from you. You've seen your picture or heard your name. My supervisor along the way, Madame Ira Tabus, Eric Biesen, whom I already mentioned during the lecture. The technicians and secretary who have helped me out with many different things. Matt Roos, Clary Dinjens, Annick Jansen, Erwin Wienans, Jacques Debet, Gregorio Fazzi, Peter Leenders, and Audrey van Golden. Thanks to all my co-authors, both international and local and international colleagues, the Animal Facility and the Animal Welfare Body for support with our experiments over the last 23 years. I enjoy organizing scientific meetings for the Dutch and European vascular community, thanks to my science buddies from the DEF, Nao Nefbo, Ja van Buhl, Boy Hube, Ed Eringa, Stefan Huveneers and Guido Krenning. My peers and the trainers from, my, from the Top Talent Program all filled my bag with experiences, tools, and some friendship to handle this job. Raymond, Daniel, Casper, Joost, Jacqueline, Mechtelt, Gira, Jos, and Jim. I'm also happy to be part of the talent program of the Dutch Cardiovascular Alliance and the UHD committee of this faculty, both with a truly their group, diverse group of peers. My friends in and out in science let me unwind, enjoy our life together, and have been there for me at various times and diverse ways. Thanks, Paula, Marion, Sylvia, Sitske, Danicia, Miriam, and my Sex and the City crew from the university, Audrey, Salim, Danny, and Maret. I am happiest when all my family members are together in the same country, like today. Papa, mom, merci. You always supported me while growing up, studying, giving me confidence and care during good and challenging times in life, and as the most amazing grandparents. The road to Maastricht became much shorter after Jasper and Sophie were born. It is a joy to see how you enjoyed early retirement with each other in good health, travel a lot, and see how you used your passion for teaching when you helped homeschool my kids. Olivia, Sam, Serena, Jordan, Sarah, thanks for your openness to be part of our modern day Stitch Together family, coming on fam family holidays, visiting us in Maastricht as often as you can, and being the heroes the little ones look up to. Thanks to my little ones, Sophie and Jasper, eindelijk in het Nederlands, niet meer zo klein, maar altijd mijn kindjes. Ik ben trots op jullie allebei, op alles waar jullie zo goed in zijn, maar nog meer voor doorzettingsvermogen bij die dingen waar je wat meer je best voor moet doen. Als jullie er zijn, is er gezellig meer in mijn brein die nog denkt aan experimentjes. Andy, you make everything better. Life, science, and me. No more words to explain that. With this, I have come to the end of my inaugural address. Ik heb gezegd. Professor Sluimer, beste Judith, hartelijk dank. Um, na deze hele mooie woorden is er weinig dat ik daar nog aan toe kan voegen. Um, had u door dat, u mij, dat ze mij verwees als familie op de eerste rij? Uh, nou, dat voelde ook, zo voelt het ons, zo voelt het hier ook. Hè? Dat we allemaal één familie uh, zijn. Of misschien was ik gewoon de diversity on the first row, dat kan ook. Maar um, we zijn in ieder geval als, als Universiteit Maastricht heel blij dat je bij ons bent en um, dat je je mooie ideeën nog verder gaat, uh, gaat uitwerken. Hiermee sluit ik het officiële gedeelte van deze academische zitting. We gaan nu naar de receptie in de Refter en als u ons volgt, uh, als u het cortege volgt, dan komt u daar vanzelf. Um, ik wil u wel een advies meegeven, blijf niet op de gang staan wachten. Don't stand in the hallway. Um, want uh, er is plek genoeg in de ruimte van de refter. En als u daar gewoon al van een drankje of een hapje geniet, dan kunt u zelf het moment kiezen om uh, professor Sluimer te felicite feliciteren. Uh, hou dat gewoon eventjes goed in de gaten. Dan hoeft ook niet in de rij uh, te staan. Um, hè, dus blijf niet op de gang uh, staan wachten. With that said, um, I wish you a very pleasant day. Ik wens iedereen een hele fijne dag.
Dankjewel.